Given that Damik hasn't actually shown up in Hiveswap yet, you'd think we'd know next to nothing about him. But in truth, between Zephros' perspective and getting to explore his house during most of Act 1, I think we have a pretty thorough window into Damik's personality and worldview. But this is only true because, since Hiveswap's release, Wap Pumpkin has provided a steady drip feed of exposition on a subject fans have been begging to know more about for over half a decade. Class bets. Thanks to the extended Zodiac, we know all trolls have explicit, canonical aspect affinities. And even Jude and Joey exhibit behaviors consistent and symbolically distinct enough that most fan discussion tends to consider the same few aspects for them. And speaking of aspects symbolic and thematic associations, the Zodiac has cleared up many misconceptions about the way the aspects were depicted in Homestuck. For example, it was long speculated that Doom had a strong association with duality and rules. But, because our only Doom players were the Captors, this was usually countered with the idea that these were simply traits unique to the Captors, or maybe to the Goldblood cast. But now Gemini has been established as a Doom symbol in and of itself. Meaning we can't draw any meaningful distinction between the captor's Gemini traits and their Doom traits. On top of that, the extended Zodiac tells us that every sign we know from the Zodiac is strongly linked with its corresponding blood cast. In other words, along with the influence of their true aspect, Rustbloods seem to be linked to time, Goldbloods to doom, Teals to mind, and so on. And it's not much of a stretch to assume classes are present too, if you consider them as archetypes. As described by Carl Jung, archetypes are simply patterns of behavior that can be expressed as, say, verbs, built into the collective unconscious and expressed over and over in different ways. Now, Hiveswap's characters aren't aware of their affinities for particular classes or aspects, but that's only natural since they're not playing a hyper-advanced game that literally tells them who they are. Instead, they're stuck trying to figure it out like the rest of us, using chunks of culture around them to piece together their own identities. So in Hiveswap, we can look for class associations by tracking patterns each class follows, references to said classes, and their respective key verbs. For example, thieves and rogues are associated with outlaws, people who live outside the comforting confines of law and civil society. Nepeta lived in a cave and hunted for food, Mina ran away to live alone on the moon, Rufio escaped regular Befra society to live in the forest with the lost weeaboos, and Riska was a serial killer who aspired to be like Mindfang, a master pirate. Joey's babysitter, Roxy Lalonde, lives an alternate life as a cyberpunk whistleblower, standing outside the Batter Witch's global dominion over post-apocalyptic Earth. Her backstory, in particular, is pretty similar to Damix. They're fighting the exact same fish queen, after all. Since they can't rely on the many, thieves in particular get immensely attached to the few they deem worthy of trusting with their friendship. And as one bound to blood, the aspect of bonds, camaraderie, and the ability to unite people under a common cause, this is doubly true for Damik. So it's not surprising that he's the leader of a capable rebel network. One that he uses to get access to all sorts of cool stuff. That Alternia's standard social order, the Hemo Spectrum, wouldn't allow him access to. He also uses his close relationship with Zephros to justify taking his stuff. Roxy describes taking as an action intrinsic to her nature as a rogue, which makes sense. The key verb for thieves and rogues is steal, which is the act of taking without permission. The two verbs are intertwined, and the comic often links the verb take with important actions related to both classes. Since Damik takes for his own benefit, as opposed to that of others, we can classify him as a thief. Which puts him in the company of Riska Circuit and Mina Pixies, who are known for morally gray actions and unsavory reputations. But while the fandom considers Damik an abusive manipulator deliberately trying to keep Zephros' self-worth down, the evidence seems to point to a reality that's a bit more complicated. Pretty much everything about Damik's Zodiac entries paint a picture of a guy who genuinely cares for his buddy, but doesn't know how to be a good friend. The Zodiac tells us that while Bronzebloods might come off arrogant and cold, they have a warm and generous disposition and crave validation and companionship. They're drawn to creature comforts like physical possessions, and might even come off as hedonists. But they are quite needy romantic partners, too. 
Damick is a prospect dreamer, meaning he's inclined to be optimistic, intuitive, and changeable in his perception of reality. And even though Damick is a rebel leader, prospect dreamers aren't naturally rebellious. Instead, they tend to adapt and coexist with authority. Which, to me, suggests that while Damick is consciously rebelling against the Hemo Spectrum, he's taken the power dynamics it sets up in his relationship with Zephros for granted, or likely hasn't even noticed them at all. Alternia is designed to pit trolls against each other like this. Zephros literally needs to be good at butlering to survive, and I can kind of see how knowing this, Damick could just kind of accept the status quo of having Zephros serve him. You know, for practice. Especially since Zephros has never told Damick anything is wrong. Prospect dreamers are more inclined to observe and react to the world around them, rather than paying attention to the inner workings of their own minds. And by all accounts, Damick's world was Zephros treating him as the nicest, coolest, bestest friend ever. Zephros is even implied to have a crush on the guy. I'm just saying, these are both kids, and their dynamic seems about as confusing for Damick as it is for Zephros. It's hard being a kid and growing up. It's hard and nobody understands. But is there any real evidence here? Can we somehow prove Damick is confused about his relationship to himself, the world, his peers, and society? Well, yes, in my opinion. I believe that confusion is expressed through Damick's relationship to breath which rules over ideas like flight, motion, detachment, and freedom. Damick's attempted rebellion actually seems to echo in the footsteps of a breath player, the Summoner, an outlaw who led a rebellion against the Empire so powerful that, once it was crushed, the Empress banished all adults off Alternia to ensure it would never happen again. And while Damick steals from Zephros through blood, the most notable thing he takes from him is the hover pad, an object of detachment, flight, and movement. It even projects a beam that's literally breath blue. There are other ways Damick steals breath from Zephros. He stalls Zephros' own direction and goals to get him to go along with his own revolutionary endeavors, and literally takes his voice through the auto-tune microphone. But things get more complicated when we consider that, like Zephros, Damick is also expected to become a butler. Which means that after his rapidly approaching exile, he'll spend the rest of his life forced to serve. And that social pressure does seem to have an effect on his behavior, because a lot of the time it comes off like Damick steals almost accidentally, without being aware of it, when what he's trying to do consciously is be of service. To serve can be read as to give, and when Damick steals Zephros' voice, he does so by giving him a microphone he made himself for Zephros' birthday. He doesn't consciously take up all the free time that Zephros would rather devote to other hobbies. Instead, it seems that he's just so enthusiastic and wrapped up in his own rebellious agenda that he doesn't notice that he's giving Zephros too many goals and responsibilities that Zephros then chooses to prioritize above his own. Even worse is what all this confusion might imply about Damick's own state of mind. We've seen firsthand how much playing against his act of alignment has hurt Zephros, but at least Zephros is innately drawn to the serve verb itself. This isn't the case for Damick. Not only is he being forced to take on a passive role despite his active sense of self, but giving is the opposite of taking, and the nature of a free-spirited outlaw is inherently at odds with a role of service to society. We've kind of seen exactly what that conflict might do to someone in reverse, in fact. When Tavros Nitrim, a page of breath, is coerced by his friend into playing the part of a rogue by taking her life, Tavros finds the experience so traumatizing that all of his breath imagery is replaced and he finds himself drowning in blood. Tavros is so hurt by the ordeal that he sleeps away entire weeks just trying to recover. But Tavros was forced into that role by a single misguided person who he could, to some extent, escape. Damick is facing the weight of an entire society, designed to trap kids like him from the start. Unless Damick finds some way to overcome the Empire, there is no escaping the role it has in store for him. So is it any wonder he's so driven, so confused, and so seemingly desperate? How much can we blame a teenage boy who can see the fate life has in store for him and doesn't like the direction that it's headed in if he gets a bit overzealous in his life and death struggle to avert that fate and loses track of the emotional state of his friend? 
What about if his friend never tells him he's doing something wrong? What about if part of why he's desperate is that his friend has an even worse fate in store for him, and he wants to protect him? And you can say that the whole situation is just reality on Alternia, and Damik should have simply known to do better. But what about when it's reality on purpose? Reality that's someone's fault. Reality that has a name and a face and a vile, malicious agenda behind it. We need to keep in mind that Alternia was designed by Doc Scratch, and he had at least two reasons to set the Hemo Spectrum up the way that he did. One, by societally pushing trolls away from their true aspects in favor of the one bound to their blood, Alternia systematically leaves trolls confused, unhappy, and alienated from themselves, making it that much harder for them to seek fulfillment and unity with others in a way that might threaten its exploitative social order. This aligns with Scratch a stated goal of corrupting Alternian Trolls' evolution into a state of endless violence and warfare. Two, the setup is practical, since Scratch would know that the twelve Alternian Trolls who end the world and place Burb would hold the twelve true signs. So designing Alternian society to favor them might have just been Scratch laying the stage for the Burb game that leads to the creation of Lord English. In a world where the ultimate adult is a megalomaniacal man-child, who stacked the deck so he could watch Drolls suffer and die for eternity, how much blame can we really put on Damik for his flawed attempts to fix it all? How much blame can we really put on any of these kids? You know, I've heard fans saying that the Hive Swap friend sim doesn't add to the Homestuck universe, but that just isn't true. Even outside of all the class spect exposition they've been giving us, the friend sims have all been designed around exploring one very important idea. How Alternia itself, through its systems, hurts everyone living on it. Low blood and high blood alike. Along with just how little any of these kids know about what having a true friend looks like, and how badly many of them seem to crave it as a result. But these are all just more thoughts to consider as we wait for Act 2. So tell me, what do you guys think? This video exists thanks to the support of my wise cohort of patrons. If you'd like to summon more videos like this onto your screen, then you can join them. Also make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you never miss another video. That's all for now. Until next time, keep rising.